<laughs> well, we're beginning to study on the Son, doctrine of the Son, of course, the Son is Jesus Christ. We're starting a new uh, study. We looked at doctrines for a couple of two or three months, and this looking at Jesus is probably going to take uh, a lot longer than uh, it did for the doctrine. Uh, as you know, every single person from creation to the end of the world shares one vital thing. And that one vital thing is, what think ye of Christ? You find that in Matthew 22, 42. You know, Jesus asked his disciples at one time, who do people say that I am? And we know they gave him several different people that uh, people said he was. Here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and I'm sure there's some scribes and Sadducees and priests and everybody else there too. Here he asks them, uh, verse 42, Christ saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. Of course they knew that Christ, Christ is just another name for Messiah, that uh, the Messiah was to come from the son of David. So they made a true statement there in saying that uh, Christ was the son of David. But they didn't think Christ was the son of David. Or at least they didn't want to admit it anyway. They wanted to kill Christ instead of admitting that he was the Messiah, the true Messiah, the son of David. Every person in, in his life here and in eternity depends completely on, on their answer to this question. What do you think of Christ? We're going to look at some people or occupations and what they should think of Christ. Maybe not what they are, but what they should think of Christ. You have the artist. He is altogether lovely. You find that in Psalms. Or not Psalm, but Psalm of Solomon. Five and sixteen. And of course, the Psalm of Solomon is a love story. It's a love story of a bride and bridegroom that are waiting for their uh, wedding so they can begin their life together and all through the Song of Solomon they give descriptions of their loved ones, what they think of them and uh, in this uh, 5 and 16 we see the uh, bride is giving her description of the bridegroom she says his mouth is most sweet, yea he is altogether lovely this is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Here this uh, maiden is describing her uh, loved one. And as we know, we've all at one time or another been down the road to marriage, and we all think our to-be is, is the most wonderful person in the world until we get married, then things change. But before <laughs> that, we think they're the best thing in the world. And she does too. And this also a picture of Christ and the church. One of these days they will be married. And we should think the same thing as Christ as this uh, maiden here thinks of her to be bridegroom. She says his mouth is most sweet. You know, we've all been doing that. Everything comes out of your partner like just the sweetest thing until you get married and then it all changes again. But you think everything they say is just the most <laughs> terrific thing in the world, you know. It's all hunky-dory, everything's going to be beautiful. Then you get married. <laughs> Boy, you got married. <laughs> <laughs> But that, that, and, and, and about Christ, it is true. You know, everything that has come out of Christ's mouth is sweet and beautiful. Salvation. You know, if he had have told us about salvation, we'd never know it. If he had have died for us, we'd never know it. 
That is sweet. Protection. He's going to protect us. He says, I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you. I'll always be there. I'll help you. He's promised us a home. A home in heaven. A home here on the new heaven and the new earth. He's promised us love. I'll love you. Never forsake you. Never leave you. I'll always love you. You'll always be my child. And again, he promised us life and eternity. You know, we're going to spend eternity with Christ if we're a child of his. And then, as I said, he got that chance of maybe in the bride of Christ. <coughs> he could be a part of that bride that marries Christ. During the Bible, the tribulation going on down here, the marriage of the Lamb will take place in heaven. You could be a part of that. You could be a part of his bride. He also calls him his friend. And Jesus is the best friend you can ever have. John 15, 13. Greater love had no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And Christ laid down his life for us. He died for us. Not only for us, but for his church. He died for it. He died for his bride. That's to be. And she says he's the altogether lovely. And again, you go back, you think you're to be he's the prettiest thing that's ever lived. And then get married. But before then, you know, everything just, just hunky dory and lovely. An artist loves to paint pretty pictures. They love to take pretty pictures. You know, I don't know of any prettier picture than there is a man that wants to get married. You know, everybody wants wedding pictures. You know, most of the people I know that have divorced, they still have to throw away the wedding pictures. They still have them. They may be stashed away somewhere. They may not know exactly where they are, but they know they're somewhere around because of their, their pretty pictures. We think, anyway, at the time. And what a beautiful wedding that would be in heaven when Christ and his bride get married in heaven. You know, heaven's going to be wonderful enough as it is. You know how beautiful they, they, they decorate churches and buildings for, for weddings and everything else down here. Imagine what it's going to be like up there. You know, we think gold is the most precious thing down here. Up in heaven is what the paved streets with. You know, what you walk on. You can imagine the kind of wedding that's going to be up there. How beautiful it will be. And wouldn't you love to be able to take that picture? Well, yes, as children of God, we will be there. Now again, whether we're in the bride or not, it's a different story. It depends on what we do down here. If we <coughs> and follow him as he has told us to, we could be in the bride. And the bride is his church. Just because you're a church member doesn't mean you're going to be in the bride. You have to live a certain way to be in the bride. But an artist, as I said, they love to take beautiful pictures. And that's what an artist should think of Christ and all the beautiful things he has done for us. To the architect, he's the chief cornerstone, 1 Peter 2. Peter 2 and 6 it says wherefore also it is contained in the scripture behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded now we build things different now than what they did back then chief cornerstone back in that time was what held the building together that's where most of your pressure was in your building, was on that chief cornerstone. It held the building up. You took the chief cornerstone away, the building fall apart. You know, you've seen the pictures of, uh, especially when you look back in the old days, of, you know, the side of the building, and all you got is arches down it. You take that one center stone out of one arch, what's going to happen? That whole side of that building is going to cave in. Because it's all pressure on both sides is going to that center stone. And once that's once that arch goes, well then that leaves this arch to go, that leaves this, it's just down for effect. The whole building comes down. Jesus is our chief cornerstone. Without Jesus there would be no true Christian. Be no need for it. 
He holds everything together. Without him, there is nothing. Without him, there's no salvation. All we're doing is getting ready to go to hell. We're going to live our life and go to hell if it wasn't for Jesus. If it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't even be here. Period. He holds everything together, especially when it comes to Christians, true Christians. He is the chief cornerstone. Without him, we have nothing. We can do that. To the astronomer, he is the son of righteousness, Malachi 4.2. Malachi 4 and 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And you can see there that Son of Righteousness is S U N, but that's just another name for the S O N. Son of Righteousness. That's just another name for Christ, a title for Christ. So it's Christ who is who they are talking about here as being the Son of Righteousness. He is our Son. Just as our worldly son out there gives life to this planet. You know, if we're just a fraction closer or a fraction further away, we'd all burn up or all freeze to death. God has got this planet in that exact orbit, at that exact tilt, at that exact spin that we can have life in. Okay. Without that, you know, everything. Same way with Jesus. He gives life to us, spiritual life. Without him, we have no spiritual life. We're either cold or hot. You know, we're either burning up or getting ready to go to hell, burn up, you know, get hot. He is the sun that we depend on, just like this earth depends on our worldly sun. Without him, we do not have life. To the baker, he's the bread of life. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall neither hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is our physical bread. You know, Israel, while they were out in the wilderness, you know, they got two kinds of bread from heaven. They got the physical bread, which was manna. They fed them for the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. But they also got the spiritual bread, which was the law. That was to govern their spiritual life. They were willing to partake of the physical. They didn't want the spiritual. Israel, most of their time, has rejected God and still rejects God. They never did want Him. At times, they've done a little better job at, at worshiping God. But most of the time, they rejected Him. The world's doing the same thing. It doesn't want God either. They reject that spiritual bread. They like for God to take care of them physically, but they don't want to mess with him spiritually. Don't bother me, Lord. I ain't got time for that. Leave me alone. Let me run things my way. They reject that spiritual bread. And if you reject that spiritual bread, then you're going to spend eternity in hell. And also you see there about this bread and also about the water, you have eternal salvation there in it. You have security to the believer. He says, once you take that bread, you'll never hunger again. Once you drink that water, you'll never thirst again. But physically, we have to. We have to eat daily. We have to drink daily to keep our bodies going. But as far as our soul is concerned, once we partake of that spiritual bread, once we partake of that spiritual water, that's it. You don't have to do it again. One time is enough. You can't ever lose it. It'll always be there to fill you and always be there to satisfy your thirst. 
And that's what Christ is. He's that spiritual bread that satisfies that hunger, satisfies that thirst. To the builder. No, to the banker. He's the hidden treasure. Matthew 13, 44. Matthew 13 and 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Jesus is a hidden treasure. How many people have you ever asked come up to you and said, Tell me, tell me about Jesus? You ever had anybody? I never have. I've never had anyone come up to me and say, tell me about Jesus. Tell me how to be saved. What good does it do to believe in Jesus? People don't want to know nothing about him. He's a hidden treasure. They ignore him. They act like he doesn't exist. But he's the most, he's the most precious, most wonderful treasure there is. Because without him, you're going to end up going to hell. We should be willing to take Christ and give our life for him if we had to. Just like this man that sold everything he had to buy that field that had that treasure in it. We should be willing to do the same thing. Give our life for Christ because of what he's done for us. He saved us. He died for us. He keeps us saved. He's a great treasure. We should love him and want to serve him in any way we can. To the builder. He's the sure foundation. Isaiah 28. Twenty-eight sixteen. Says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Jesus is our sure foundation, our solid foundation. If we don't build on him, then we don't have nothing. You know, if your foundation is built on baptism, sorry, it ain't gonna work. If your salvation is built on church membership, sorry, it ain't going to work. If it's built on good works, sorry, it ain't going to work. The only solid foundation there is, is Christ. You know, like the parable. The man that built his house on the sand. What happened when the trouble rain, the rain came? Washed it away. Why? Because it wasn't on a solid foundation. The other man dug down until he found the rock. Solid foundation. He built his house on that. We're to dig down on Jesus. We're to build on him. That man built on that solid rock, and when the rains came, his house stood. It didn't, it didn't float away like other man's. Jesus is our solid foundation that we're to build on. We're to look to him and no one else because nothing else is solid enough for us. Solid not solid enough for him. He has to be the one. To the carpenter, he's the door. John 10. John 10, 79, 7 through 9. It says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door that we must go through to find God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, a carpenter goes out and builds his big grand house, 
Then put a door in. What good does it do? When the rain comes, the snow comes, the cold comes, freezing rain comes, you can't get out of the weather. You still can't know that mess because the dummy didn't put a door in place. What good does it do? You got a house without a door, it doesn't do a bit good. In heaven, there's only one door. That's Christ. That's the only way in. You get out of the weather, that carpenter got to go back and put a door in that house. To get out of the spiritual weather, we've got to go through Christ. Only through Christ. He is the door. He is the only door. He is our only escape from the trials and tribulations that come here in our life. To the doctor, he's the great physician. Mark 2, 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. And I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is our spiritual healer of spiritual sickness. It is through his death, burial, and resurrection that we have salvation. It is through his death, burial, and resurrection we have the ability to uh, be part of his family when we accept him as our personal Savior. He's the only healer to that sin sick soul, and only through him can we be healed of our sins. To the educator, he is the new and living way. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrate, consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Jesus brought us a new and living way to worship and serve God. Before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you had to go through the Old Testament ritual, through the uh, offerings, through the new moons and old moons, uh, festivals, all the stuff you had to go through uh, to, uh, to worship God. But even in all that, you could worship God, but you couldn't go to God. Under the Old Testament, you had to go to a priest. And for the priest could go to God for you, he had to go sacrifice for his own sin. Then he could come and take your sacrifices and take them and offer them up. Before then, now we don't have to. Now I'm glad we don't have to. Sorry, but I don't understand all that all that, all that stuff, you know. I know all that stuff pointing toward Jesus coming and dying on the cross. But sorry, it don't make sense to me. You know, I'd get lost. I'd do something wrong. Because that, the old dumb me can't, I'm not smart enough to keep up with all that stuff they had to go through and do. I'm glad we've got it the new way. I'm a priest. I don't have to go to a priest. I'm a priest because I'm saved. I'm a child of God. You're a priest if you're saved. You're a child of God. You don't have to go to nobody else. We can go straight to God through Jesus Christ who is our high priest. And Jesus is God himself. So we can go straight to God. We don't have to go through nobody else. And that's the way Jesus brought with his death, burial, and resurrection. He brought a new way of worshiping. Now salvation was still the same back then as it is now, faith in Christ, where they look forward for, for Christ coming and dying, and we look back at Christ coming and, and dying. But Jesus brought that through his death, burial, and resurrection, is coming to earth and living with us for some 30, 33 years. He brought this new way of uh, worshiping God. To the farmer, let me get this right quick, this is the last bit. To the farmer, uh, I'm going to say 
receive the Lord of the harvest, Luke 10, 2. Luke 10 and 2. Therefore said he unto them, this is Jesus speaking, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The farmer. To the farmer, Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. He is the one that will eventually reap the harvest. The farmer also has to sow the seed. Jesus is the seed that we sow. It is his word that we sow. And if you study the way they farmed back then, if you study the way they farm today, it's totally different. You know, we farmer and I farm for a little while. You know, we went out, we got our ground all ready. Tested it up, you know, if, if we needed a, a rose, we would put rose in it, you know. And when we planted, we planted right there. We didn't throw it out in the road. We didn't throw it in the weed patch. We didn't throw it in the rocky places. We only sowed where the ground was prepared. Back then, they sowed it everywhere. They just went along with the slang. That's Jesus' word. We should be doing the same thing. We should be slanging Jesus' word everywhere. Not just here. Not just in our family. We should sow it everywhere. You know, even though most of those seeds that went in the path and went in the, the, the uh, grass and, and off in the rocky places, there's always one, maybe two, that will grow and produce. If you don't believe it, you go out and take you some corn and throw it out there in the weed somewhere. There'll be one that comes up So we need to spread God's word everywhere. Just like them old soldiers did. And God is the Lord of the harvest. There's going to be two harvests. The saved and the lost. If you're saved, you're going to spend eternity with Christ. If you're lost, you're going to hell. And God is the is a, is a harvest. He's the one that's going to harvest. He's the one that's going to judge. And he's the one that's going to send you to your respective places. It's up to us as to what we do with Christ. What do we think of Christ? Is he your Lord and Master? Or is he somebody you don't know anything about? Hopefully he's your Lord and Master. Y'all got anything y'all want to add?